And welcome to Islamic Jurisprudence, the show on MTA where we delve deeper into the what's and why's of life as a Muslim in modern day society. Today on the panel we have with us Kashif Vriksab, a missionary posted in Sweden, and Shazad Ahmed a missionary posted here in London. Now in our previous show we discussed the concept of marital life. The teachings that Islam gives us in regards to living in this holy matrimony in the most perfect way possible. Now, of course, Islam is a natural religion, understanding some of the natural occurrences that undoubtedly sometimes happen in people's lives. Unfortunately, in some cases, divorce is one of those natural occurrences. So therefore, Islam also provides us with teachings in regards to this situation and consequence in life as well. Now, jumping straight in, Shazad Sab, looking at the concept of divorce itself, now, of course, we understand that it is very unpleasant and it's a situation that nobody wants to um, come up inside of having you know, gone into a, a marriage to look for a, a healthy and happy option in life. To find oneself in divorce is, of course, a very unpleasant situation. But having said that then, and of course, Islam sees it in a very unpleasant light as well. Why does Islam allow it in the first place? Sure. So, Mansur Sab, as you quite rightly said, that marriage is a very a holy and sacred uh, alliance. And so... It's always uh, unpleasant and hateful to terminate uh, a relationship that has uh, cultivated through mutual intimacy. But having said that, Islam does not make it impossible that for one to, to go their separate ways or seek divorce and separation if in a marriage uh, the couple are extremely unhappy and it's impossible for them to live together and then that could naturally have a detrimental impact upon the future generation uh, it could have an impact on their, their relations with their relatives, or in-laws and so on and so forth and it can cause many other uh, conflicts and problems. Mm. So Islam allows in these extreme cases for the divorce to take place or for the couple to be separated. And that is why the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stated that Abghadul Halal Talaq that out of all those things which are permissible for a Muslim and which are halal, the, the case of divorce is the one that is most disliked and so this in fact is one of the uh, from this aspect if we look at it, it actually reflects the perfect uh, and most balanced and beautiful teachings of islam that how it caters for all our needs it is sometimes it's impossible as i said for a couple to live together and so in those extreme cases islam has given that allowance for both men and women to seek separation and with the case of divorce as it is mentioned in the video as well, that this right has been given to both men and women equally. So that is, in a nutshell, uh, in, in regards to divorce, that, that Islam allows it mm. in most extreme cases, but it's most disliked. I see, I see. Jazakumullah. Gosh, often when we look at the concept of divorce in Islam, there is a misconception in regards to the concept of haqmahir, and that haqmahir must only be paid when a divorce occurs. Well, what is the truth behind this? Well, the Hakmar according to the, to the Quranic teachings and the Sunnah is that it should be paid at the inception of marriage. Right. And uh, the woman has the right to claim it during any time during the marriage. And, uh, but as you said, even if the divorce, divorce happens, still the husband isn't relieved of this responsibility. He has to pay it. Uh, before this separation is absolute and take place. They can separate, of course, but still it will be a debt for him uh, to be paid to the wife. So it is wrong to see, you know, the Holy Quran says uh, that tatum, when you initiate the marriage and you mm -hmm. start to getting your rights and responsibilities from your wife, from that very time, moment, the duty to to pay the haqmar is uh, starts and begins. I see. So it has nothing to do with uh, divorce specifically I see thank you um, in regards to I mean we've talked about the money giving in terms of the haq mahir, but also we've discussed in previous service about how the burden of financial responsibility 
lies primarily upon the husband. Um, of course, the, the, the wife or the mother, or indeed, they can um, provide in whatever way they wish to, but the responsibility is not upon them, it's upon the husband himself. Once a marriage dissolves or once the divorce happens then, what or if any effect takes place on the responsibility, financially speaking, of the husband? Sure, so in Susab, the Holy Quran gives very clear guidelines and injunctions in the unfortunate circumstances of a divorce. The, when the divorce is initiated by the husband, there is a period that is known as the Iddat. The Iddat consists of around three months. And within this period, if the husband and wife seek, wish to seek reconciliation, mm. they can then continue to live their life and continue to cohabit uh, as a husband and wife without the nikah being performed. However, during that period, once the husband has initiated the divorce, yeah. for that period, which is known as the, the, the three months, the husband is responsible for all the finance, the financial responsibility lies upon the husband towards the wife. However, after that period of iddat, when the divorce is binding upon both parties, then the, that financial responsibility that he has, that no longer remains. However, you also mentioned in regards to children, however, his obligation towards his children will remain, for they are his children, he has a relation with them which will remain, and so he will um, fulfill those obligations and those duties that he has towards the children. Mm. Also having said that, if the divorce happens while the wife is pregnant or she is uh, breastfeeding her child, mm. which as the Quran stipulates is a period of two years, right. then during that period, he will bear the expenses, all the financial expenses during that time as well. So in a nutshell, this is what I I in regards to the, the Quran, the guidelines, the very clear guidelines that it mm. gives mm. about the financial responsibilities that it have. Yes, after the divorce is binding and both parties have gone separate ways, then of course, then the husband has no obligation towards the wife. I see. Um, but of course, the laws of the land must also be respected. And we find that in certain countries, the law stipulates that a certain share has to be given. And so, of course, as Muslims, we are to respect the laws and the authority. So those also have to be followed as well. So, for example, in regards to when, say, half of the house goes to the yeah. wife, that kind of thing. So yeah. living Absolutely. by the law of the land. The law of the land. And may I also add as well that the Holy Quran is very clear in this as well, that during also in the time of the, the divorce as well, which again, mm. as I said, is, is an unfortunate uh, occurs in unfortunate circumstances, very unpleasant. But even then the Holy Quran says that you must um, see them off in a very becoming and pleasant manner. And if you have given them anything during, the, during your time as, uh, as a married couple, anything that you have given them, in fact, even if you have given them a mountain f uh, full of gold, mm. even then you are not to take a single penny of that back. Even a single thing should not be taken back. Whatever you have given remains as the wife's. And you should see her off and send her away in the most pleasant and becoming manner. And of course, this is aimed at... The, the, we, we keep on using the pronouns of he and, and the, the, the man should because of the fact that the He's financial responsibility yeah. is on the man. And therefore, the things that he has given. It is a given that whatever the woman has, that is obviously hers anyway. I think the important point to remember here is that although these teachings often do use the pronoun of, of, of a male pronoun or he, these teachings are both for women and for men. Of course. That the idea behind the Muslim marriage in its entirety is a living of righteousness and living by of taqwa and of love and compassion. And that should also be tried to, we, we should try to keep that that same love, that same compassion, that same happiness in that divorce as much as is possible so yeah. as to create a, uh, a harmonious relationship even as the relationship dissolves. Yeah. Gosh, Shazad Sahib also mentioned about abiding by the law of the land. Now the custody of children is something which is a very pertinent issue, especially in the day-to-day, -day, especially we see a, um, a rise in divorces across the world in fact. Now in regards to custody of children, there's an allegation that says that Islam treats the mothers unfairly. I mean, what is the truth behind this and what does Islam teach us in regards to this? Well, we should all remember that uh, when someone separates, of course, they are worried about their children and their future and mutually they should decide what path is best. But in, at times of conflict and disagreement, then the teaching of Islam says that you should not look for the better, better part for the father or the mother, mm. rather you should look what is best for the child. I see. So as uh, the mother is emotionally attached to the child, 
one should not deprive a child for, from its mother and the initial years preferably should be spent with the mother. But later on when the child grows up, there comes a time uh, around nine, ten years that he also has to, you know, his physical and moral upbringing and spiritual such and there the father also plays a role. So both these aspects have to be considered. And as the child grows up and can consider what is best or what is not, not good for him, that child or his or her, then that child will decide herself or himself where he would like to stay. And then the Qazi of the time, the third party would uh, judge according to that, that what is best for the child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's the main point to take away there, I guess. It's as opposed to, often we see custody battles in you know, the courts of today. Mm -hmm. We see that the idea is, oh, you're taking my children away from me. Often it's the idea that the parents in some way are having their rights taken away. Whereas in reality what Islam does, it gives the rights to the children and looks at the betterment of the children above all else. I think that is one of the most important things. And again, you're quite right in saying that both the mother and the father, they play a, a pivotal and essential role mm -hmm. in the upbringing of the child. Even if the relationship between the mother and father has broken down, a Qazi will still decide upon what is best for the child, incorporating both the mother and the father. And of course, these, the Qazi will only get involved if there is discord and disagreement between the parents. Often, as we see, if individuals abide by the beautiful teachings of Islam, a, a very common and very mutual understanding can be, can be brought to. Shazad Sab, we have talked different, about different um, elements of divorce. Now, two topics which often come up and two words which often come up of khula and talaq. Now, often in the, in the UK or indeed any of the Western countries, we just have the common concept of divorce. Yeah. So what is the khula, what is talaq and how are they different? Sure. So, Mr. Usab, the, the right to seek separation, Islam has established for both men and women. And this actually is a testimony to the teachings of Islam, of its fairness and the social justice and equality that it promotes. So where man has the right to divorce, that right is equally given to women as well in the form of khula. So when the divorce is initiated by the man, as we have briefly touched upon as well in the, the earlier question, that is known as the talaq and divorce. And when the, um, the separation or to seek separation is initiated by the woman, it's known as khula. Now there is a slight difference in this from when it's done by the man in the form of divorce. With the khula is that the, 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 the wife will go to the qazi or a judge and approach him first. And the reason for that is is as a, an extra layer of protection for her and to safeguard her rights because at a state she, she could be most vulnerable as well and so the Qazi or the judge can determine whether she is being coerced and whether she is being pressurized into mm. giving the khula because the reason for that is, is because when the, the divorce or the separation is initiated by the wife in the form of khula then she gives up a right of uh, acquiring the, the mahr, the haq mahr which has been stipulated at the time of nikah so she gives that right up and so that's why she goes to the, the, to the administration first or to the judge for the betterment of the, wife. The, betterment of the wife so mm. that he can determine whether she is being pressurized into that or whether she actually is seeking separation. And as far as this, uh, as we said, that this social justice and equality that Islam has promoted, that in many cultures, even now, women do not have the right to divorce. They mm. do not have the right to separate. And particularly in the time of at the advent of Islam, this was the case. However, Islam established these rights for women and simply in the fact that at times there were examples in the lifetime of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam someone, uh, the lady came to the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said that the marriage had taken place against her will mm. and the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam allowed her to seek separation in the form of khula and also sometimes just merely in the fact that if they just do not want to live with the husband if they dislike the husband and do not want to live with him they can exercise that right. They have the right to exercise the right. But as I mentioned before, that the Holy Prophet Sallallahu has emphasized on this, that to live together and to, to ensure that you live mm. together and exhaust all means possible to live together, is the emphasis should be placed on that. And as, he, as I mentioned before, that he had stated that Abghadul Halal Talaq, that is the most disliked thing. So we should, although we have that right, mm. but we should be very careful as to before how we exercise that right. Indeed, indeed. Gosh, sir. There is also another teaching in the Holy Quran which safeguards the women, specifically at the time of divorce. The Holy Quran says, La tarisun nisa karha, that you should not forcefully inherit your women. Mm. Now, what does this mean? In some cases, the husband uh, rejects the right of the lady forcefully and does not allow her to separate so that 
when she passes away, he can have the right of her property. I see. Even this kind of injustice does occur and did occur at that time. Or it could be that when a lady is widowed, then the, her husband's family doesn't allow her to ma marry anywhere else mm. so that the property should remain, remain within the family. But Islam says that this kind of practice is so wrong. Uh, a woman is free that after divorce or after she's being widowed, that she should seek her future in another family or with another husband. And it also says that لا تمسكونا ديرارا Do not uh, withhold them, do not keep them in, so that you can transgress against them. So in every aspect, in every teaching, there is, an, uh, there is a teaching which specifically safeguards the rights of the women and of the wife. I see. And Kajsub, just on that note, that is when the situation has got to that position where divorce has become something which is inevitable. Before that, however, mm -hmm. what steps and what guidelines has Islam put in place to prevent divorce happening in the first place? Yes, so there is a period where both parties, both the husband and wife and their families are involved. And this is called tahkim in the Holy Quran. Hakaman min ahlihi wa hakaman min ahliha. That is, a, a wise or elderly person from both sides are selected and they are to see where are the wrongs, where are the uh, wrongs taking place and is there any opportunity for these both to reconcile which is the best way of course according mm -hmm. to Islamic teachings and they will seek that option if it is possible and if it is not then they will actually suggest that in this case the both, it is best for the, both of them that they separate. So this uh, element of tahkim is there, reconciliation which takes part with both families involved. I see. Yes. I see. So that's what I mean, looking around in society in general, we see divorce has, uh, is almost rife in right now in society, looking around. Do you think that by following the principles and teachings of Islam, this almost epidemic of divorce could be countered? So, Ms. Usa, we spoke uh, in one of our previous programs as well, the great noble character of the Holy Prophet وسلم, and the teachings of Islam that we find in the Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet of how he treated uh, his wives and equally how the wives the duty towards their husband and how they fulfill that in such an exemplary manner mm. so when a husband and wife of course it is inevitable for disagreement um, but of course when we look at the overall teachings of Islam and we adhere to those teachings we find that we create peace within our homes and with that then you'll find that the, the, the issue of divorce and these cases will naturally we will limit them and they, they will decrease naturally if we are adhering to the true teachings of Islam because we will create peace within our homes. But yes, of course, as I mentioned as well, that in the unfortunate circumstances when all other means have been exhausted, but even then there is no way of establishing that peace and harmony and they cannot reconcile their differences, then yes, in that unfortunate circumstances, divorce is there. So if we follow the teachings of Islam and follow the noble ex example and the character of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu we will find that many of those uh, conflicts and discords will be put to rest. I see. And so that's when we have a couple who have divorced, but then after having divorced, they re wish a reconciliation. Yeah. They wish to get back together as husband and wife. Can they simply continue their relationship or would they have to remarry? So Mr. Usab, that's why the period of iddat is there. So once the divorce has taken place or has been initiated, there is a period of iddat. So before any legal proceedings can begin, you have this three month period. And that's why it's there so that one can, because at times, of course, the, when the talaq has been given, or the divorce has been given, it's a time of very high and strong emotions. But when you have three months to ponder over it, and also one of the other wisdom is, is that if the, the wife uh, is expecting, mm. that can be made evident. And that may also become a means of changing one's mind, increase their love for one another, Indeed. and they may want to reconcile. So if within the period of this Iddat, the three month period, they seek to reconcile and live together, then that is possible without the Nikah. However, after the three month period, that divorce becomes binding on both, and then the, the relationship is completely severed. And so in that case, if they want to reconcile and come together, then the Nikah has to be performed. Because you see the nikah is also a declaration that is made on the part of the husband as well that he now takes on the responsibility of the wife of providing for her and being the guardian of the house and providing mm. for the children as well. The sole responsibility is placed upon him. So that's also a sort of a declaration on his part. So he reaffirms that declaration that he will now look after his wife 
and fulfill her responsibilities, and hence why the nikah has to be performed. It's almost like a renewal of the vows. We see this in many cultures yes. where people vow at the time of marriage. The only difference is that is in, in Islam, they do not just vow to each other, they vow in, in the presence of God as well, yeah. by swearing to God. And it's almost including God in this communion of marriage, that by God we will try our best to fulfill these, yes. the, these yeah, vows. You're absolutely right. And the verses that are recited during the time of nikah remind us of that, remind us of righteousness and piety and virtue. So yeah. again, it's a reminder of that, of that holy matrimony and sacred bond that we have and they have to honor. Indeed. And as Shizasab said, normally the period of Iddad is around three months. But uh, in the case when the wife is pregnant, mm. then the Iddad period is during the pregnancy. All of the pregnancies is, is referred to as Iddad. Okay. And that is because, you know, if you're expecting, maybe that factor can lead to reconciliation. Mm. For the fact that you're having a child, child together, maybe that will make yourself amend your mistakes mm. or, or, or maybe regret previous uh, mishaps and then reconcile. So I think also it ties in with the earlier question that you mentioned that how the Islamic teachings prevent the uh, or limit the cases mm, of mm. divorce as well. That's also one of them by having this three month period or in some cases a nine month period. It gives you that time to reflect and ponder when you are at, in, 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 over a long period of time. And then sometimes that can be a means of reconciliation as well when you can ponder and reflect and rationally think about something. Mm. I think also another point which recently we came across was this concept of many people talking about um, if whether or not two people are compatible. But actually I think what the, the point is to focus on whether or not two people are adaptable. Mm. Because no two individuals when they marry each other are perfect for one another. Rather they learn through their steadfastness, they learn through humility and humbleness yeah. and also through sacrificing your rights for the rights of the partner which I think is a very important thing to understand as well. Keeping this in mind, of course there is a situation where when, if divorce actually does occur, what is the actual process in which divorce is taken? I mean, is it simply just a, a verbal thing or is there a real process in which divorce takes place? Well, the, in case of the husband and talaq, he is to inform the wife about his intention of giving talaq. And from that very, when she is info being informed, the period of iddat starts. Whereas if the uh, wife wishes to see khula, mm. she will go to the kazi and uh, inform the husband through there that she wants to separate. And uh, in that case, uh, there in the case of khula, there is no, if it is, of course, mostly it is accepted by the kazi, he will look into the benefits and the negative aspects of it. But he is there to actually assist the women. Mm. So if the khula is accepted, then there is no iddat. And then if they want to reconcile, then there is another nikah for that. I see. I see. Another ceremony. Um, Shazasa, we've talked about the, the concept of if a family wishes to reconcile, they can have the nikah done again. But often we see in many societies that this almost becomes a farce where an individual, where two individuals will get married very shortly after they get divorced, then they get married, then they get divorced, and this continues to happen. What has Islam prescribed in regards to this kind of a situation? Sure, so Masusab, in, in that regard, Islam has put the limit to three uh, divorces. So a couple who, after marriage, after the nikah has been performed, they divorce, and then, of course, if they reconcile um, and divorce again, then they are allowed to do it the third time, but after the third time, it's known as talaq e batta. And that means that now, even if they wish to reconcile after the third talaq, mm. then it's not possible. Unless um, they, another nikah is performed somewhere else, and that's not done intentionally. It happens to be performed somewhere else, and then they are divorced. Then there is a possibility that they can uh, have their nikah performed again. Otherwise, three is the limit. Thereafter, Islam says that it's talaq e batta, it's binding, and now they cannot uh, be brought together through the nikah. And just before we move on to, I, I want to ask, Ashtab, I want to ask you about this concept of halala. But just before we go on to that, Shazab, you, you've mentioned about this um, talaq taking uh, three months and this, uh, th this period of time in order to promote the thought process and the contemplation yeah. of the two parties. Now, there's often an allegation in regards to this talaq, 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 and that yeah. by saying it three times, the marriage becomes absolved. And this is a, a huge cultural problem around the world. Where does this stem from, and is there any truth behind it? So, so you're absolutely right. This is actually a, a sort of a cultural thing that's quite rampant in, in various cultures. 
and that is that you say talaq three times and then it becomes binding. But the fact is that the Holy Prophet has very categorically stated that that there is the there is a fixed period between one talaq and the next. So once you, regardless of how many times you repeat the word talaq, that will count as one talaq. Mm. And then as we had discussed as well, there is a period of iddat. And then if reconciliation takes place within that, then it's all well and good. And if not, then it becomes binding and then the car has to be performed again if they seek to live again together as husband and wife. If they divorce again, that will then be considered as the second talaq. This idea of saying it three times in one go and having it considered as a talaq, but that then now, even if the nikah is performed again, you still cannot we live together, that's completely wrong. It is not to be found in the traditions of the Holy Prophet ﷺ. In fact, having said that, it became quite a, a, a common practice uh, during the time of Hazrat Umar that people were repeating it three times in one go. Mm. And so for that temporary period, Hazrat Umar actually said that whoever does it three times in one go, that will be considered as talaq i bata, but that was a temporary injunction for that period to remove that social ill that had become rampant. Um, which was then openly of course then said now this time period is finished but of course people still misunderstand that and misinterpret it to be uh, to be an to active be open instruction and today doing it yep indeed gosh i mentioned before about the concept of halala and of course we've talked about these uh, the talaq i rajoo talaq i bayan talaq i batta how does halala come into this and what this this cultural practice what is the truth behind it yes as she says i explained that after the third divorce you cannot remarry unless uh, you, uh, you marry first another partner, then eventually that marriage also breaks down. I see. But what people adopted during uh, dark age ages was that this marriage was, uh, a temporary marriage was set up and then cancelled in order for the initial couple to get together again. Mm -hmm. So this is an un-Islamic practice which has been highly discouraged by the scholars of Islam and the Promised Musa Islam and Khulafa have in old ages condemn this practice is un-Islamic. The Holy Quran specifically says that if by chance that marriage which takes place after the third divorce and they, she marries another husband, if that breaks down, then she, if the older couple wants to reconcile, then that is possible, but not deliberate and intentional breakup. So halala is this, this practice of setting up almost this false marriage, as it were, mm -hmm. yes. for the purpose of failing so that we can uh, we can remarry the same spouse again. Jazakallah, thank you. Again, Jazakallah, thank you very much to both of our panelists for the brilliant answers today, and thank you for shedding light on the Islamic teachings of divorce. Again, a thank you to all of our viewers at home, Jazakumullah, and Jazar, for listening to this program. But please do remember to send in your questions to ij at mta.tv. That's I for Islamic and J for jurisprudence. ij at mta.tv. And inshallah, we will get around to answering your questions as soon as possible. Of course, they can be on any topic that you wish to. Send them in and inshallah, we'll get around to answering them as soon as possible. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم 